Hello and welcome back to Planet Sail and indeed to the first in our new series. More on that later. Now these are troubling times and I do hope you're keeping well and that it remains that way. These are also fast moving times and you'll notice from some of the pieces that the news has actually changed quite significantly along the way. So please forgive the little edits that we've had to make uh, to take that into account. And anyway, the background was too nice and it reminds us of where we're all going to be in not too long, I'm sure. Enjoy. Hello and welcome back to Planet Sail and welcome to our new series, On Course, which takes a regular look at the sailing world. Welcome also to our new home here at Warsash Sailing Club on the banks of the River Hamble on the UK's south coast. Now in this show we take a look at how to do a scary jibe on a 49er, the thinking behind a radical new one design, a major crash in the Caribbean, and an update on what's going on in the America's Cup. We start on that very subject with the news that the America's Cup World Series event in Cagliari in Sardinia, the first to happen this year, has been cancelled, another victim of the world health crisis. There were actually only two teams there at the time. There was Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli, uh, the challengers of record, and Ineos Team UK that had set up down there just shortly before Christmas. American Magic was just about to get on a ship and head over there and the Kiwis were halfway, we understand, to getting up towards Cagliari when the decision was made. The next event on the Cup calendar is the America's Cup World Series event in Portsmouth on the 4th to the 7th of June. Fingers crossed that that's going to take place. But the Italians have been having a drama of their own as well as the bowsprit ripped off the front of their boat, taking a large chunk of the bow with it. Little more is known about the incident, which we believe happened during training. What we do know is this is the second structural problem that the Italians have had since they lost their mast in January. On the subject of dramas, a collision between two classic J-class yachts in Antigua sent shivers down the spine. The accident happened on the opening day of the Antigua Super Yachts Regatta between Svea and Topaz that collided just shortly before the start of the first race. Two crew members were injured in the incident and received medical attention. As we wait for the first event in the road to the America's Cup to get underway, American challengers American Magic have recently put out a video called Trust is Earned, which gives a fascinating insight into how the team is working. It's well worth a watch. At the end of the day, we're here to win, and that is paramount to everybody's decision making throughout. It's just different questions of how we're going to get there. Trust doesn't just happen overnight. The biggest faith is in the 11 guys that are around you while you're out sailing at, at 40 plus knots. Once we get on the water, we're all pretty much on the same page about how we're going to take care of the business. The American Magic team is a pretty eclectic group. Yeah, you have teams of 120 people from design and engineering, shore support. With so many people who are so driven to achieving the same thing. Hand choose and pick a lot of guys on the boat that I've worked with and sailed with over uh, the past decade. We have all the power in the, in the handle from the, the grinding side. And then there are the three guys at the back, myself, Andrew and Dean. As a sailor growing up, winning the America's Cup has always been the pinnacle event of our sport. I know quite a lot of these guys through competing. You know, I've been racing against Paul Goodison since I was in high school, so, you know, we've been racing against each other for that long, but never together. The more you can learn about each other and, and be with each other is, is certainly helpful for those more intense situations. There isn't much downtime involved, but quite often we'll try and meet up and, and do something a bit away from sailing. The team dynamic is always, you know, that's your X factor. I 
agree with the term that the stronger we are as a family, the harder we can argue as a family. <laughs> The trust component of this boat is immense. The point is, when you have 10 other lives in the helmsman's hands, uh, everybody on the boat has to trust him. We practice for the catastrophic situation that we may experience on the water. If one of us is slightly off in the timing, how do we cover so that we don't capsize? Whether or not you can depend on a person to do their job in a critical moment is something that you learn over years. You know, when push comes to shove, we'll be that team that nobody can put away. It's blowing old boots, your foot's flat to the floor, you're hammering downhill. It's pretty exciting, but there's a stressful bit coming up. You know you've got to jibe. How often do you take the option to tack around? Well, in this next clip, we're going to see how two real top 49er sailors dealt with that very issue. It's pretty impressive. The footage was shot by 49er sailors Marco Grail and Gabrielle Borges as they competed in the 49er Oceana Championships in Geelong, Australia. To be honest, tacking around is one thing, but swimming around the back as well? Respect. Among the exciting new racing boats to be launched recently was the Club Swan 36. She's been an eagerly awaited Grand Prix 36 foot master blaster. Well now she's in the water and I sailed her last year down in Spain and she made her first public appearance at a boat show at Dusseldorf just recently and I went to go and have another look but I also caught up with her designer, Huang Kei, to find out more about this innovative design. It's got a very un a radical sail plan on it, a very radical rig. It's obviously got your C-section force. Tell us a bit about, for those that haven't seen the boat, tell us a bit about what your thinking was behind the Club Swan 36. Well, the Club Swan 36, uh, uh, before anything, had to be uh, a one-design uh, boat that 
uh, that was buildable in a in a production way and and hopefully for a, a cost level that was um, that made it available to as many people as possible. Um, so it it couldn't be super high tech, but I believe, and I'm obviously biased in saying it, but the purpose at least was to sort of find a good compromise between um, a, a level of uh, technology uh, that produces excitement to the sailor because technology for nothing is worthless. So that technology needs to allow the sailor the sailing say, wow, this is, I like it, you know, I'm, I'm having a good time. And at the same time, um, being accessible to a, a wide uh, um, a range of people. So that's what we <coughs> try to do with our boat. So for example, we did the sea foil because of course if you do America's Cup type of foils or Imoca type of foils, it will be more performant. But then, then the, the cost of maintenance of those foils and systems, let alone the cost of the system themselves and the complexity to ask an amateur crew to, to, to deal with that properly, it's, it's nonsense, it's, it's, it defeats the purpose. So we sort of simplified it into a single foil that doesn't achieve all the benefits, but achieves some of them that uh, we believe that that's where the reasonable level needs to be um, found. Now, it might be a little bit more over there or a little bit more over here, but this is what, this is what the purpose is. And I think that they, we should allow for projects like this, or other projects in the future, to, we, we need to welcome them and promote them uh, to, to basically keep pushing technology forward. Technology that is used to put smiles on people's faces, not just for the sake of technology. So the C-foil in itself allows for a very small keel to be only um, be there to hold the bulb, and a, and a small bulb thanks to the rig. So in essence, we use the C-foil only upwind and close hold uh, reaching, and downwind at a very uh, high speed, like when the boat is above uh, 18 knots or so, then it pays off. So in essence, we don't use the foil for going downwind, only for sort of tight reaching, but because we retract it. But in fact, retracting it means using it because if you wouldn't have that option, then you would have to make a very big keel. And therefore, the retraction of the foil um, indeed doesn't use the foil itself to go downwind, but because you have that foil retracted, you can have a very small keel that downwind has a lot less drag and the boat is faster. So we're using it by not using it, if you will. But upwind, uh, inversely, because the keel is so small, you need a foil to actually help you. And that's when you deploy. And then in between those two extremes of upwind and downwind, there is some reaching conditions where you use the foil to, thanks to the speed, to sort of take the boat up and do what we call skimming, which is not flying, but having the boat sort of leaning on the foil and on the back of the hull, and sort of have a, almost like a planning uh, or soup planning type of uh, behavior. That was the concept. But then in order to, and then I get to the rig, in order to exploit this property, you need the boat to be very light. Um, the biggest part of the boat is the bulb. So you say, well, how do you reduce the weight of the bulb? And the answer to that, or at least the answer we thought, was to have a very efficient rig when it comes to depowering and, and sort of feather the forces that you have. So uh, if you didn't have that kind of rig and if you had a very sort of uh, uh, stiff rig that doesn't allow you to go through a big range of power depowering, uh, you, you're enforcing a, a bulb which is as heavy as the overpower situation of the rig is and therefore 90% of the time you end up sailing with too heavy of a bulb and so that's how the things relate to each other. Who knows whether the Olympics is going to take place or not this year but in the meantime here is an absolutely beautifully shot documentary that goes back to the 1952 Olympics in Helsinki and the birth of a new class there, the 5.5 metre design. It focuses on the work of two Swedish naval architects, the Olsen brothers, who became particularly famous for their work with the 5.5 metres. It also includes some fascinating interviews, it's well worth a watch. After the Second World War, the International Yacht Racing Union, which is today called World Sailing, 
decided that the sail racing world needed a new, less expensive, meter-class boat. A boat that could both drive the evolution of sail racing design and challenge the best international sailors. Designers were invited to come up with ideas, and in 1949, the International 5.5 meter class was born as the Union finally approved the formula presented to the Union two years earlier by Charles E. Nicholson. The formula is based on three parameters. L is the length just above the waterline. S is the sail area that should be in the range of 26.5 to 29 square meters. And D is the displacement in cubic meters. 5.5 kommer bli ungefär hälften så tung som en 6 meters båt exempelvis. Den var en halv meter kortare. Den blev då utsedd att bli olympisk båt inför 1952 års olympiad i Helsingfors. The 5.5 is a different animal because it feels different. And I, I sail my boats by feel I'm afraid. As a result of that I knew you know, this is a nicer boat to go out sailing in. The Olsen brothers became fascinated with this new class and wanted to make every effort to be on the 1952 Olympic starting line with an Olsen-designed boat. A consortium was formed by Eric Hansen, Carl Eric Olsen, Birger Jonsson, and Folke Wassen. Soon after, design work started on the boat they named Hoiwa as an acronym of the members' names. In January 1951, it was time for the next step, to build the boat at Martinsen's Yard in Svinaviken on the west coast of Sweden. Det var i den lokalen ni har här till höger här, i det gamla hulet där. Det byggdes som och det har vi bevarat på grund av att det har ett värde för oss som driver vidare. The boat was built in Carvel planked mahogany. The essence of Hoiva was a bold experiment. A stiff-shaped but not too heavy hull with, above all, very good heavy wind qualities. This made her well prepared for the Baltic Sea weather. At the Olympics in Helsinki 1952, the skipper, Folke Wassen, together with Magnus Wassen and Carl Eric Olsen as crew, managed very well and ended up winning the bronze medal. For the Olsen brothers, this was their breakthrough into the international yacht designers' high society. Kvaliteten på de här svenskbyggen, byggda båtarna, fick ju världsrykte. Och det var hit många internationella berömda kappseglare kom för att beställa sina femfemmer. Other prominent 5.5 meter designers in the coming two decades included Arvid Lorin, Raymond Hunt, Bill Lutters Jr., Henri Copané, Olin Stevens, Giulio Cesare Carcano, and Britton Chance Jr. Einar's excellence in yacht design, combined with his brother Carl Eric's experience in craftsmanship and sail racing, created a successful team. From very early on, the Olsen Design Office understood the importance of using the best experts in boat building to achieve high quality and cost-effective building of hulls. Therefore, the 5.5 meter Olsen design boats were mainly built at the Swedish yards which had a global reputation. Leading up to the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, Australia, the renowned Swedish sailor Lasse Torn ordered a 5.5 meter boat designed by the Olsen brothers. This was Rush 5, and the boat was built at Kungsor Yard, run by Oscar Schelin. To succeed in building the best 5.5 meter boat was not easy, but Oscar Schelin took up the challenge. Devoted and passionate, he and Lasse Torn worked day and night to get the boat ready. Once you've got a boat, it's like a person. It's you. You, you live it, you think about it, you wake up in the night say, I think we should have another shackle put in this way, or perhaps we should do that, and I do, I, perhaps everybody does. But if you don't do that sort of thing, you get into the boat and uh, you've got nothing, nothing to go for. The hard work paid off when Lasse Torn, with a crew of Jelmar Carlsen and Sture Stork, 
won the gold medal in the 5.5 meter class in the Melbourne Olympics. The triumph in Melbourne led to a boost in sales to clients all over the world for Oscar Shaleen and the yard in Kung Zor, and of course, for the Olsen Design Office. From 1956 to 58, Einar Olsen and Bill Lutters emerged as the leading architects in 5.5 meter boats. Either by sheer numbers and exposure, or superior design, or both, Olsen boats kept coming out on top. I think it was a combination of Einar's construction and lines and so on, coupled with the boatbuilders, the very good boatbuilders we had in Sweden. As usual, the naval architects in the 5.5 meter class were very busy working towards the next Olympic sailing event in Naples, 1960. Einar and Carl Eric Olsen designed five of the 19 boats competing in the races. The best of the Olsen boats was Webb II, built in Kungsor by Schelin, with the Danish skipper, William Berntsen, winning the silver medal. Naples was difficult. There was really a one-way course all the time. And we, we were there with the Olympics. And so unless you got the track, you weren't going to win the race. It's quite interesting. Pressed for lighter hulls by competitive owners, Oscar Schelin and his craftsmen at Kungsor Yard pioneered the use of lighter woods and fastenings, shaping them to minimum weight consistent with strength and scantling requirements. One of the boats built to compete in the 1964 Olympics in Enoshima, Japan, was Rush 7. Skipper Lasse Torn wanted to give it a try to repeat his gold medal victory in 1956 with an Olsen-designed boat. The race in the 5.5 meter class was extremely close and the overall victory was decided on the last leg of the final race. The American John McNamara was leading but made an error as he tacked and tried unsuccessfully to cross Lasse Torn of Sweden. The American ended up getting the bronze medal, Lasse Torn the silver, and the Australian Bill Northen won the gold medal. Six of the nations on the starting line in this event had boats designed by the Olsen brothers. In the following world championships in the 5.5 meter class during the 1960s, the Olsen design office had the best numbers. In Naples, Italy, 1965, one third of the boats were Olsen designed, including the winner. In Copenhagen, Denmark, 1966, Paul Elvstrom won with Webb 3, an Olsen design. Three of the top four boats were Olsen designed, and in total the Olsen brothers designed 14 of the 47 boats in the race. Brenna Olsson was very conservative in his construction. It was a long chair, it was a long scroll, it was a lot of work. So I knew that if you bought the Olsen boat, it was a lot of work, the Olsen boat was a lot of work. The internationally famous skipper Robin Asher wanted to compete once again in 1968 Olympics and therefore contacted the person he considered the best designer in the world of 5.5 meter boats, Einar Olsen. He's always been one jump ahead in lots of parts of where it is, if you know what I mean. He's always there first and other people then say, oh, I, you know, they move along and that was to me, it's wonderful. He designed Yeoman 15, and the boat was built by the small yard Arvidsson and Carlsen in Svinabiken on Sweden's west coast. Well, I'd only been in yards where there is space enormous, and there's a boat being built there or another one there. So, first of all, I was quite surprised that it was, it seemed rather small, you know. And then I saw the boat they were building and realized that it only just fitted in the, in the room. So that was interesting. And then I saw people working on it. And I've seen people working on building boats before now, and they seem to have a different style of building the boat, as if it's something that you would want to have, and not that something banged together. It had a different style that made me think, this is going to be a nice boat to sail. In the 1968 Olympic races in Alcapulco, Mexico, Robin did not get all the way to the top, but managed to win the bronze medal. At the end of the Olympic era in 1968, over 650 
5.5 meter halls had been constructed worldwide, and 53 of them had been designed by the Olsen brothers. After the 5.5 meter class lost its Olympic status ending with Al Capulco, many designers and sailors lost interest and moved on to more modern design classes. But events like the annual World Championships and of course the legendary Scandinavian Gold Cup kept the 5.5 meter class going. The class is still alive today and naval architects constantly try to develop faster boats within the formula. Minimal changes have been made to the 5.5 meter rule to keep up with time. The most important is the one to separate the rudder from the keel in 1969. And the class continues to adopt new boat building materials. Fem fem meters regeln är så tillvida modern att den har blivit en utve utvecklingsklass och det har sett en dramatisk förändring. Och den dramatiska förändringen har sett i, i stötar. Today the 5.5 meter boats are divided into three divisions depending on age. Classic with boats designed before 1970, Evolution between 1970 and 1994, and Modern with boats designed after 1994. The classic boats that are alive today are very well kept and looked after by their current owners, so the fleet of these beautiful designs with divine proportions can still be viewed plowing gracefully through the waves all over the world. As we will discover, this unique era in Swedish boat design and boat building inspired the Olsen Design Office to take the successful concept of the 5.5 meter design and use the ideas in other boat design segments in the decades that followed. Well, once again, thanks for watching. Please do make sure you subscribe if you haven't already done so. We're on Facebook now as well, so watch out for us there. And please do let us know what you think. Send us some of the videos, send us some of your stories. We'd love to see them. Keep well in these difficult times and we'll see you next time.